The GT40s, in my opinion, uh, are fantastic cars because of their history. They're the only American car that ever really did that well in international racing. They're beautiful to look at. They're very, it's a very emotional car. They're absolutely fantastic to drive. There's no rational reason. When you start collecting things, uh, you know, do you really, can you really explain why you do it? it it's, it's a love for the car. It's a love for the history. And uh, I just fell in love with the cars in general. So you got this one in 83? This car uh, in 83. I uh, bought my first GT40 in 1980. Uh, this car in 83, uh, it's an interesting story. The car was purchased with three others by some investors from the East Coast. They took the four cars, put them in crates, shipped them to Belgium, stacked them in a warehouse, and just left them there for four years, basically, until their advisor said, now it's time to get rid of them and go on to something else. So you bought all four? I bought all four, and that's the only way they would sell them. I had Ronnie Spain from Scotland come down. Ronnie is the, the He's guru. the authority. He's the authority, the world's authority. This car was in primer, did not have a chassis plate. So the owners had no idea what it was. They knew it was a Mark II. They, they didn't know any of its history. When Ronnie Spain first saw it, he became very excited because this car had sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. Actually, the other two GT40s did too and he had no idea where they were. Well, this is the one that, that won the 66 Le Mans. Yes, and when Ronnie first saw it, he sort of thought it was, but he didn't want to say that it was without further checking. There are certain things that he looked at, and it took him, I want to say, four or five months to be 100% certain. So George, can you show me some of the unique features that helped you and Ronnie identify this as the 66 Le Mans winner? Certainly. Some of the things we can't see, there's holes in, uh, in various parts of the chassis for ducting. There's holes in the floor that were unique to each car. Uh, several things that are quite visible would be the cooling slot here that was put in by hand on every car, and every car had a different slot. Almost a signature, eh? It, absolutely. The other thing was the roll bar. These cars all had roll bars installed after Ken Miles was killed. And each roll bar, like the slots, were put in one by one, individually, so they were all different. Now, the, the fuel setup in this car, the fuel tank setup, was kind of unique too. The fuel tanks are actually in either side, right in this area, coming back to here. And initially they had fuel bladders. This is a 427 with a single carburetor. It puts out uh, or let's say in 1966 it put out 485 horsepower. It was a relatively low-key engine. They were built for reliability. They were built for power, but mainly reliability. To run 24 hours, you have to have an engine that uh, will last, obviously. The engine is not that different from what you could buy in a Fairlane 500. It's amazing. Now these are interesting too. These are actually luggage compartments, right? The uh, rules in that day dictated that the car had to be road legal. It had to have headlights, taillights, blinkers, had to have two seats, and it had to have room for luggage. And that is the only place really that you could put a luggage compartment. And I bet it got kind of warm. It must have gotten very warm, especially after 24 hours. The cockpit is actually quite spacious. You can see with the, the bubble, gives a little bit of extra room. What we had to do, because I'm 6'1", we had to do some modifications in the, uh, in the cockpit to make it roomy for me. One of the things that make a car win is that the driver is comfortable, and if he's comfortable, he can drive much better. Well, George, we're, uh, we're sharing the track with some Indy lights today, but they're gonna knock off for lunch soon. Do you suppose we could take it out on the track for a couple hot laps? Let's do it. All right, let's go. I've driven and ridden in a lot of cool cars over the years, but my dream has always been to ride in a genuine GT40. With George behind the wheel, the GT40 performed as if we were on a warm-up lap at Lamar Sebring. 
The car's interior is small by passenger car standards, but surprisingly comfortable, even when the G-forces have you pinned into your seat. When we returned to the pits, it was time for professional driver Mark Gillis to strap into the GT40. Mark was hired by a Japanese auto magazine to test and review this Ford racing legend. It didn't take him long to post short straightaway speeds in excess of 160 miles per hour. The combination of the sound of the roaring 427 and the thick, damp air of our overcast bay made me wonder if we were actually in England instead of Wisconsin. But then again, when you get a chance to see a GT40 at speed, it doesn't matter if you're on the moon. After about 15 hot laps, Mark returned to the pits with a smile on his face and nothing but praise for the GT40. My thanks to George Stauffer for making one of my lifelong dreams a reality.